Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, where we examine the dots and we put the dots together in a world that's changing while we watch. And one big change that could happen, may, may, may be likely to happen, is that Trump gets elected or finds a way to occupy the Oval Office again, and he, he, uh, he destroys NATO. He's made that very clear that he will do that if he gets a chance and elevate Russia so they can do, quote, what the hell they want, end quote. And this is actually just another important reason not to vote for him. We can't afford that. But let's look at it as a sort of an, a political experiment, a geopolitical experiment. What happens without NATO? We've been examining what happens if Trump is elected, how our world will change. This is a, it's a very scary story. But let's let's do the Emil Zola-esque kind of you know political experiment and ask what happens without NATO. So for this discussion, we have Dr. Rupati Kandakar. She's one of our esteemed guests, skilled, experienced, and thoughtful about geopolitics. And uh, we'll see what she has to say about the implications of a world without NATO. Welcome to the show, Group Mati. Aloha, Jay, and thank you for having me on this show. And it's nice to talk about what happens without NATO. I wish we could talk about a world with, if Trump was not running for president this time, isn't it? That would be a much better topic than everything It would is. be. It would be a happy topic. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's talk about it. I mean, there's all kinds of implications and things, you know, and we, and we have to speculate at least to some extent. But NATO has been the 800-pound gorilla uh, of Europe, of, of the Western world. Um, not to say that NATO has been involved in, uh, in, in violence or war, but just deterrence for a long time, since World War II. Um, except on one occasion, you know. Only one time Article 5 of the NATO agreement has been invoked. And when was that? It was right after 9-11. When, when NATO came to the aid of the United States after it was attacked on 9-11. On That's the only time that NATO and Article 5 have been invoked. But it has stood as a huge deterrent uh, to other aggression until now. Um, so let, let's talk about what would happen. What would happen um, if there were no NATO? You can address this from any side, any perspective you want. Yeah, Jay, Jay uh, NATO was formed as a deterrent and it was formed as a counter to Warsaw. So uh, we know that uh, this is the only viable military defense cooperation that the world has at its disposal. And NATO acts on world affairs with an uh, international system as uh, United States as hegemon. NATO carries a very prime role to play in the international system. And this uh, notion is known as collective defense, Jay. And this uh, notion of collective defense is very important. It's a transatlantic cooperation between uh, Europe and America, Canada, uh, Turkey. These people get relevance of a military stature through NATO. And NATO stands to be very uh, um, vital in international uh, relations, Jay because of the infrastructure that it possesses. It only uh, takes about 15% of uh, US military spending, but see the, uh, the overwhelming uh, impact that NATO has on international relations, Jay. Because with NATO, there's a defense for those 41 European nations. What about collective security? Could European nations afford uh, a your security on their own. Can they afford a nuclear deterrent for each of the countries? They can't, Jay. They are not in, they cannot simply, I can tell you one thing, they can't afford it. And America through NATO provides Europe that security umbrella that uh, it gets. And biggest, biggest deterrent and biggest, biggest uh, bear in the room is uh, Russia, Jay. NATO is a, a shield for European nations against Russia. Ukraine, the whole issue of Ukraine trying to get into NATO and Russia opposing it, 
the, the rush to get inside NATO's uh, protective umbrella is because of the uh, response that NATO gives to crisis abroad. And their uh, implementation of military strength does not require, uh, you know, the infrastructure bureaucratic uh, uh, impediments like the UN. They act in um, the interest of the self-defense of its members. It's simple. You attack one NATO member and all the NATO members have to come in. So their uh, collective defense logic is very simple. They don't have to go through resolutions. They don't have to go to veto. No, nothing. So this kind of quick action is only available to the world or, say, privileged NATO members only through this infrastructure. So they simply can't afford to give it up. And uh, the European nation state, besides not affording it, uh, they would they would have a dis rather a defense policy like East European uh, nations would concentrate only on um, Russia. West European nations would concentrate on the transatlantic. Uh, they would not have this comprehensive uh, defense strategy. So that is why NATO plays a very important role in foreign policy also, when all the nations come together and frame their policies. Well, you know, it's already weakened, isn't it? I mean, for example, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and it was only half a dozen countries at the beginning, but over time, they all wanted to, to have the benefit of that mutual defense. And a lot of countries came in, and you think, mm, maybe maybe that wasn't so great that they came in, because they pulled the other way. And I'm thinking uh, specifically of Turkey, <coughs> which I don't think is a good member of NATO. I'm thinking of Hungary, an autocracy, which is, I don't think is a good member of NATO. They'll pull the other way. So even now, and especially with Trump's remarks, and especially with Trump's remarks on how he would give away Ukraine and let Russia do, quote, what the hell it wants, end quote, on day one of, it, of his uh, administration. Um, you know, I'm not sure that NATO is what we had thought it was all of these years gone by. It has weak members or members who are not loyal, as we would wish. Um, we have uh, people who don't, countries that don't pay their freight, although most of them do. Trump lied about that. Most of them do pay the freight. Um, on the other hand, their political will may, may not be the same as it was. You know, three weeks ago, a month ago, uh, Olaf Scholz and uh, Jan, what's his name, uh, Stoltenberg uh, in NATO and the EU uh, said that they were going to get $60 billion, $50, $52 billion together to support Ukraine. I'm, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for that to happen. Hasn't happened. And meanwhile, Ukraine doesn't have ammunition, and it effectively lost uh, another battle, like yesterday. So this is this is very problematic. Uh, already, uh, Trump's comments are having an effect on the resolve of NATO, on the deterrent effect of NATO, and on uh, Putin's Putin's approach. Putin is is uh, taking advantage. So, gee whiz, um, it would get worse, wouldn't it? What would what would Russia do if there were no NATO? See, um, right now we we are uh, in a hegemonic system that is one leader at the helm of the ship. But all critics, all uh, all uh, uh, vocals of the international system say that we are moving towards a multipolar world, and multipolar world means you know China and Russia cannot compete with the U.S. But together, they are trying to come together. Together, they are trying to come across as a viable option collectively against the United States. And when they come together, they are trying to get through NATO. The diminishing of the rel uh, reliability and relevance of the NATO plays a big factor in pushing China and Russia at the top chain. To bring them to the top two players is uh, you know, giving a seesaw balance to the power of the U.S. And this. Uh, um, uh, you know, when they operate, region, there's a regionalization of security rather than an internationalization of power, you know, uh, of uh, power politics. There is a kind of, a, uh, you know, you'll have allies slipping away. And uh, the U.S. actually has, does not have burden-sharing allies. Does not, really does not, uh, U.S. bears the uh, burden of most of the costs of most of the 
security sharing uh, arrangements of the trade sharing arrangements the us takes the lead and uh, nato is one such uh, institution where you provide military support so that kind of is a very big factor j in um, stamping uh, us uh, authority in the international system and when you undermine this you're going to give russia and um, china the chance to come up with alternative viables and for them to they do they do get scared the deterrent is true when you uh, when ukraine happened you know uh, they were they were careful to say no nothing of nato is coming in the countries are uh, supporting on their own if nato had come in it would have been a full onslaught of warsaw versus uh, nato but that is the kind of uh, importance that nato holds so this when you say that uh, nato is coming into help that means they are going to deter russia completely and that kind of we don't have any alternative to nato if there was any alternative to nato and then we are talking of giving up nato it was a different thing but without having any alternative you're giving up a military structure and that well, is I, a problem. Know, i think i think um, putin would be more aggressive um and uh he would he would take greater advantage of ukraine the moment he was sure that nato was no longer in place uh he would try to take more territory uh he would try to take you know uh, it depends on the circumstances he might try to take all of ukraine all of it um this and the really uh, one of the as you said one of the big deterrent features is nato big feature <laughs> and and if he if he was not blocked by nato or the deterrent effect of nato um he, he might take try to take the whole ukraine and if no if no support was coming from the us and if nato wasn't supporting them because it didn't exist and the eu decided it was more mm, to their advantage not to do anything uh then what we would have is uh, is peacement i mean appeasement Out of, out of Munich in 1939, it would be right the end of the West, so to speak, as as a hegemonic force. So yes. that's very a great concern about Putin because he would see this as a big opportunity, and all his predatory instincts, predatory instincts, uh, would come into play, and he he would be attacking weakness, weakness across the board, and that means. Weakness, uh, as far as Poland is concerned, uh, which is a member of NATO. Uh, weakness, as far as the Baltics are concerned. Uh, weakness, as far as Scandinavia is concerned, Finland, Sweden. Weakness, as far as the Balkans are concerned. That whole border would start moving. Would be at risk. Uh, he's already pushed uh, those countries, not by kinetic war. But by high, uh, by cyber war, and by insidious undermining of the government there um, through um, crowds and protests that work working for him, paid protesters. I know he's done that in Romania. So you know what's happened here is that he's already moving. This would let him move much faster. And I think for this discussion. If we are assuming that NATO isn't there, we're also assuming that the U.S. isn't there. Yes. You know, right now we're nine months going on eight months away, and Congress is locked up, not going to do anything. There's no money um, for for the Ukraine, um, and if uh, if uh, Trump gets into office, there'll be no money for NATO or the U EU. Would be an isolation. One of the things you mentioned as we were preparing for this is is that the nature of borders would change, the nature of togetherness in Europe, uh, of a union, um, of working together would change. And how would that how would that work? If if we if we say that uh, there is no NATO, how would it change the relationships at the borders among all, all the EU countries? Yeah, the most effective partnership in international relations is always about the might, the power, the military, the strength, and you know the operability of uh, 
uh, your uh, ammunition. So this kind of transatlantic partnership, which is uh, spanning military operation operability, is because of uh, uh, NATO. And when you have that missing, uh, and you lose the link, don't tell me markets are going to unite the countries the way military does. Uh, Europe has a you know a feel good uh, factor, or they come under the security blanket of the U.S. and from under NATO. And this missing would may would literally, literally Europe is in shambles right now, looking at prospects of immigration, uh, economic recession. These things are going to play a big factor in the coming years for uh, European foreign policy. And to not have a military operation, and they will have the individual prospects, like we spoke about, the borders will implode. The end of globalization, like we discussed it, becomes nearer and nearer. And they do not have international, uh, you know, if uh, America talks about markets, the factor that they do help militarily plays a very big role, Jay, in uh, uh, considering all uh, interactions. And if that was not an operation and you have to just consider uh, market uh, costs and, you know, um, assets, that would have, that would be a totally different ballgame. So this way, when you uh, undermine NATO's credibility, you, you, you leave aside these factors also, the impact that military plays on these other factors of keeping globalization alive. This is the only uh, legitimacy that NATO gives to the countries to operate. You and mentioned that there'd be a certain amount of fragmentation among yes. uh, the, the countries of Western Europe. And for that matter, the, the Baltics and the Balkans as well, Scandinavia. And they wouldn't necessarily go in the same direction. You know, one, one logical possibility is that if there were no NATO, uh, the members of the EU would create an alternative NATO. They would say, Let's, we're going to pool our resources, we're going to come together, uh, you know, we're, we're going to meet uh, in Strasbourg or somewhere, um, and, and we, are, we are going to make a mutual defense uh, arrangement that replaces NATO. Uh, what do you think the possibilities are of that uh, versus the other possibility is they would all be fragmented, all be weak, and some of them would seek special deals with Putin just to stay on no. his right side. But what, what's going to happen in terms of the solidarity of the former members of NATO and the EU? Ah, the second option seems more practical, Jay, because the first option, they can't, Europe can't afford a security blanket over it at all. The 41 countries don't have the military spending that NATO does. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, NATO gives this operational military advantage. Anything happens under the uh, banner of the NATO, Europe can play politics. Now, you tell me, which individual European country has a standing in international politics to voice or to implement an opinion? So uh, this kind of uh, blanket uh, operationality is not possible for European countries. It's only because of uh, the courtesy of the US that this is possible. The United States is such a vital player in international relations. And you, know, you have critics, you have posts which undermine this situation day in and day out. Tell me a world where you don't have uh, uh, European, uh, American decision making, and then you let me know what would be the state of affairs. There's a monitoring going on. There is a supervision on. Putin would be on a mad run if there was no uh, fear of NATO coming in at any moment of time. You know, uh, NATO operates in Brussels, but uh, that kind of proximity that NATO has, or it's right in the center of the world, like you said. Europe, Brussels is the cockpit of Europe. So uh, America having a vantage point in Europe is a big factor for American politics. But it's a much, big, uh, much, bigger, big, big, much bigger incentive for European countries to have a military shield from America. And Jay, more uh, of interest to European partners than to America. Isn't yeah, let, let's let's talk about the U.S. for a minute. You mentioned, uh, <laughs> let's assume no NATO. Let's assume this uh, fragmentation of Europe, uh, isolationism, you know, begins to prevail. Um, and we'll talk about our autocracy in a minute. 
Um, what happens in, in the U.S.? Uh, you know, one thing is, I tell you, I would be very unhappy. I know you would be very unhappy. I, I, you know, I, well, what can I do? What can we do? What can the you know Democratic Party do if the Republicans continue to block aid to Ukraine and allow uh, a guy like Trump to to pull the plug on NATO and effectively also on the EU? Uh, what happens here in this country? What's the echo effect? Hey, uh, when or if and why Trump should come to power, we will have some funding shut for big important issues like we had last time, climate change, UN funding. Everything was just abruptly cut. And he promises to uh, cut off Ukrainian uh, war funding. And that becomes a big, big issue because not only then Russia comes to close proximity to Europe, they do get a more challenging voice to uh, now because of their supplying oil and gas, you know, mm, such a big effect Ukraine war had, such yeah. a big effect. Hundred billion dollars flew into, uh, flowed into uh, the Iranian economy. They were in shatters, they were shambles. And then they funded Israel war. This kind of implications that uh, uh, the cascading effects that every decision has, you know, you'll have Putin, you know, jumping on the doorsteps of Europe and dictating terms of the oil and gas. You'll have uh, so many other things. And America can't play house inside its borders. It is a global leader. So that kind of foreign policy domination has to be sustained because you can't have the dragon or Russia at the, the helm of international politics because, like it or not, U.S. has always played a, a benevolent role rather than a selfish role. But be assured, China or Russia, as head of the international system, would never play such a role of uh, having a kind of balanced... Uh, they, they are very, very, like we talk, were selfish. And they only talk about their motives and their, uh, they, they are more interested in um, self-propaganda, like the Communist Party itself just talks about itself in China. The same way they would do in international politics. It's just about me, myself, and I. And the U.S., besides thinking of me, myself, and I, would also think about a small country. So that is the difference that the benevolence is the difference that the hegemon uh, would needs to have. And the U.S. has been successful because of this strategy. And NATO is a military wing of the U.S. foreign policy. So for America to let go of NATO is also a big folly for American national interest. Let go of, you know, international geopolitics. Well, would, would a failure of NATO and uh, the fragmentation of Europe and all that, would that, do you think that would remind us of our, of our true morality? Or would we be further still away from it? Because I think part of the model we're designing here is that Trump would be president. And uh, this is going to happen if Trump is president. If Biden were president, it wouldn't happen. Uh, we would continue to support uh, NATO. But if Trump were president, um, gee whiz, would the failure of Europe, of Western Europe, of the West, so to speak, uh, would that, do you think, change the politics in this country? Yes, Jay. Uh, too fast it would change the politics of the country. Because Europe, as a transatlantic ally, uh, a, 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 a conglomeration of 41 countries together is a big asset for U.S. politics. And for them to have a big brother in the U.S. is an advantage for them too. And you see, club them together, it's half of the world, more than half of the world. So that kind of market, that kind of uh, industry, that kind of trade, and those number of borders open, they play a very important role in all this chain. Uh, and when you have uh, these kind of restrictions which would come in, or you know, isolation politics that come in, it would not help American national foreign policy. And that is why we have to always look outward. That was the way, you know, uh, going outward was never um, the part of. American policy. They never interfered in the Cold or in the World War. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, then they came into the World War, right? So America has always been pushed to do things rather than you know, they're coming into uh, uh, action. 
So this NATO came in because uh, Russia had formed the Warsaw Pact. So this kind of sustainability of the might is, you know, naturally it's a leader, the U.S. So yeah, you know, it's just you, you remind me of this, this possibility that if the United States is no longer supportive of Europe and the United States uh, is the one that brought the sanctions, it's not just support for Ukraine now. It's not just support for NATO. It's the sanctions that we imposed on Russia, however effective and whatever he did to escape good part of those sanctions. It seems to me that if we had a fragmented Europe and a, and a country that wasn't supporting NATO or the EU or Ukraine, those sanctions would be meaningless. They would go away in a moment. And, and, and the sanctions, to the extent that Europe had imposed them, uh, on Russia, they would go away in a minute. In other words, the whole thing would be rolled back in, in Putin's favor. But you know, <clears throat> you talked before the show about, um, about regime change, um, and you mentioned that a number of countries would suffer regime change, or maybe they're on the, on the way to suffering regime change right now. Can you talk about that, Rupati? Yeah, Jim. Uh, uh, NATO is a military operation, mostly. You know, the sanctions, economic, everything is fine. But the fear of the sword of military hanging uh, on every neck is very important. And when you don't have this kind of thing, there will be regime changes because there'll be no uh, supervision. And Jay, uh, like in any human uh, personality, unless you have a monitoring uh, entity, they go haywire. The same happens for countries. When you don't have a monitoring uh, entity, they will they will play havoc in politics. And uh, NATO operates in so many different areas of uh, international system. The civil wars they come and operate. You know they have they when when uh, even in the responsibility to protect of the United Nations, Libya, NATO was the first one to uh, be there. You know if the UN doesn't operate the uh, NATO would. So that kind of uh, reliability that NATO offers uh, is a big factor in uh, the regimes that operate. And Jay, in every country we know, politics is always unstable and everybody is always waiting to take over. There's a coup uh, happening, there is a you know a mutiny happening, there's a civil... Uh, everything is uh, very unpredictable. And without you know having the fear, you know, Europe would be Russianized isn't it? So that kind of uh, domination that we see, the entire regime could change. Finland, Sweden, they would have a hard time in keeping their borders. Uh, they they are very safe under NATO's umbrella, NATO, uh, uh, Finland. So now when you see these, you know, without NATO, can, you know, the Scandinavian countries stand the might of Russia? It's a big question that they would have had, they would have had to face. And uh, the kind of role that Russia plays in regime uh, operations is huge, Jay. They do dictate terms to all these regimes. They have these fighters, they have these, you know, uh, operatives that take place and dictate terms to the politics of a country, which would go haywire if there was no need. Well, you know, are, there, are, so there, there always is the UN, I'm joking. Don't there always know. is the UN. What, 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 <laughs> effect, what, what effect would the end of NATO, for that matter, the EU, uh, have on the UN? Would it be able to step in? Would it be able to, you know, reorganize things and develop a mutual, mutual alliance of some kind, mutual defense arrangement? Um, or would it be, um, <clears throat> would that be possible? Jay, UN, UN has been non-functional in the entire Ukraine-Israel uh, episodes. They don't have any credibility left in international relations right now because of the lack of military operations and the overburden of bureaucracy. We don't have any decisions made. We have resolutions pending. We have books being written. We have everything done, but 
operation and uh, implementation is missing and nato is the only military institution in the world which does that leads and operates instantly without any we have such burdens of veto we have burdens of resolutions we have voting we have uh, anti war you know nothing there's no alternative to nato you know the western <laughs> alliance has, has has come together behind the us in the name of NATO and in the shadow of NATO for a number of um, controversies um, and, you know, um, incidents around the Middle East. So, for example, there were NATO countries with the U.S. during the Iraq war. Uh, there were NATO countries with the U.S. Um, in Afghanistan. There were NATO countries, there are NATO countries now, maybe it's limited to the UK and maybe France. Uh, there are NATO countries now in the Red Sea that are trying to deal with the uh, impediments to shipping uh, by the attacks by the, uh, uh, by the Houthi. So um, I guess they would, they would all go away. Um, would, they, would they go away? Would we still see support? Um, for American presence, the American presence in the Middle East. Um, I think we have to look at the Middle East separately. It's much more complex in a way. Um, what would happen to our friends and partners in NATO uh, when NATO was gone? Yeah, Jay, uh, NATO, uh, you know, the importance of NATO would be felt in all these uh, points like Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia, where you have China and uh, all coming in. Individually, if America goes to forge partnerships, it's fine. It does all that all the time. But that collective response, which happens at the blink of an eye, would be missing. That's the only thing that would be missing, that if we had to get into any military operative, there is no existing structure that would be present to just uh, uh, get into implementation. They would have had to, again, have to be bilaterals, multilaterals, and then get into an agreement. Here it is, uh, that simple notion that I told you, if anybody attacks a NATO member, all NATO nations are obligated to come together and to support this collective security that, that uh, there is. And um, more than a setback for the US, it would be a huge, huge setback for Europe and a big uh, boost for Russia and a celebrating point for China. So mm. this kind of uh, comprehensive impact that the end of NATO would have is uh, overwhelming because it would change geopolitics uh, in a very hard way. Well, let me, let me ask about, um, you know, the, the elephant in the room as far as the Mideast is concerned uh, mm. is, is the war between Israel and Hamas. And, um, you know, Israel is making its way down to, the, uh, you know, the south of, of uh, Gaza, um, but at, at, a, at a cost of propaganda, because the um, Hamas has been very effective at uh, convincing the world that Israel is the aggressor. Um, and so we have a war that may not end right away. We have a war where a lot of, a lot of countries have spoken and are still speaking in the International Court of Justice uh, and in, in the media. Um, and uh, it's, it's very hard on Israel because we uh, have hundreds of thousands of young people in the service and away from the economy. Well, people don't realize that the traumatic effect of all of that on Israel's economy. And all with the backdrop is that if Israel doesn't solve this problem, it's going to get worse. There'll be yes. more attacks, more atrocities, and so forth. And the drumbeat for a two-state solution is, uh, you know, it's, um, I don't know if that helps or will help. But my question to you is, um, although um, Israel is not a member of NATO, and uh, although Hamas is not, not a state, and the Palestinians are not a state, um, the fact is that it's on, it's on the front page every day, all of this. And if there were no NATO, if there were no defense alliance among the Western countries, 
how would that affect this ongoing war uh, between Israel and Hamas? Jay, uh, Israel and Hamas was an episode where you sure saw very strong American uh, foreign policy and the, uh, the power with which they come to help their allies. The strong bond that America shares with allies and the advantage to have America as an ally was, you know, evident in this war. As soon as uh, Israel had, you know, we always talk about this six antagonistic uh, neighbors waiting to pounce on it. America did not wait for any, um, you know, yes from anybody. The warships were right at the uh, Israel door and, you know, help arrived at the right time. Otherwise, we would have had a very um, explosive event after the October 7 uh, attack on Israel. Jail. And, uh, you know, this would have just gone on and on and on. So American foreign policy was at its best when it came uh, to the aid of Israel. And uh, that is when independent foreign policy talks. NATO would have had to have a little bit of discussion whether they want to go for Israel or whether they want to support Hamas. You know, you don't know this kind of thing. So uh, that kind of independent foreign policy. NATO, to an advantage for America, is there, not there. It doesn't matter. America will always have a very strong foreign policy. And they don't make two uh, faces about it. But for NATO, for Europe is very important. American foreign policy will never, never be uh, uh, weighed down by NATO uh, implications. They have a very strong independent policy. Well, let me let me ask you this though, and this is my my last and perhaps my most uh, challenging question to you today, Rupati. Okay, so um, it's, it's hard to define war these days. Because you can have a cyber war that destroys a country and its economy and without any kinetic war, without any guns, actually. You can have um, various uh, controversies and confrontations all over the world, but that may not be, a, uh, in the old definition, a world war. It may be a lot of wars that are around the world. Um, so it's, it's hard to get our terms defined. Um, but given the fact that, that the loss of NATO, the lack of NATO, would embolden Russia and China uh, to be more, uh, uh, you know, um, more aggressive and would fragment Europe, uh, not only militarily, but economically, and would probably have an effect on all of the countries that are connected, uh, uh, that are in Europe, the, Bal the Baltics, they would be really afraid the Balkans, um, and for that matter, um, uh, Africa. And and the likelihood is that, that the Mideast would somehow become even more of a hotbed for the yes. lack of NATO. So right. with, with all of that, if we take NATO out of the equation, are we closer to world war? Most definitely. Most definitely, and even optimistically speaking, yes, Jay, because that would give a free hand to the holder of the biggest arsenal in uh, of nuclear weapons, Russia. Russia is on a rampage right now with no reigning in power. They are literally doing what they want, and uh, a nuclear war would um, erupt between, you know, a small trigger would give rise to this, because Putin, when, right now, he's in a comfortable position. He thinks he's doing good. But just imagine if he was in a compromising situation. He is not that kind of a person who would surrender. If he was going down, he would go down with the whole world with him. And he would, you know, he would not let, it would not be like Hitler in a bunker. It would be Putin with the world himself and taking everybody with him. He would just go on a nuclear rampage. And uh, Ukraine would be the first one to hit. I mean... This kind of unpredictability of the minds is uh, so evident because Jay, neither did he have any uh, considerations of international strategy, nor did he have any uh, uh, considerations of what would happen if he would transgress um, Ukrainian borders. He has just done what he wants in the new, uh, Ukraine war and nobody has been able to shut him or you know, nobody has been able to contain him. And 
as he moves on day by day, he gets more powerful. And the author, uh, you know, the legitimacy that he derives, he's declared as a war criminal. He goes for diplomatic visits to countries which do not have him as a war criminal. So that kind of maneuvering that he's, and the comfortable level that he's reached in international politics today is uh, very fine, Jay, because after attacking a country, you are still getting that kind of legitimacy and those kind of welcomes uh, and that kind of support from your allies all over the world. Uh, no, they want your know, oil and gas. <laughs> they want your oil and gas. They want to make deals yeah. with you. And, and they come at this from a point of um, dismissing the United States mm. and uh, dismissing Europe and the West. So yes. it, 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 it's, it's a fertile ground for, for him. The other, yes. the other point that comes out of what you're saying is that autocrats don't care, just as you said, Rupati, autocrats don't care about, about humanity. They don't care mm. to be humane. They care about themselves and their own power. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's also a definition of, uh, of Trump. Um, so if, 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 if the idea of an autocrat cares only about his own power and who, um, you know, has nuclear uh, weapons and the button handy, uh, then Trump is as much a risk as Putin. Oh, yes. And, you know, the, the idea of Trump with with um, the magic suitcase and the buttons on the nuclear weapons is really 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 scary uh, because he is an autocrat uh, in every way. Well, here we are, uh, hoping that none of this will happen. But thank you for joining me in this uh, this inquiry into what would happen if we uh, take out um, uh, NATO. It's like having your teeth removed. And, and you have you have to deal with a, a predatory monster without any teeth. That's what it's about. <laughs> the, the word that comes to my mind is, yeah, I would heard this word a long time before, megalomaniac. So we'll be having two megalomaniacs in the world <laughs> soon. <laughs> but whatever happens, Rubani, we will keep on talking and inquiring <laughs> and investigating and sharing our thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.